everyone else. Open up to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. We're going to look at uh, verses 1 through 7. I want to kind of uh, give us some vision for what we're doing between now and Pentecost Sunday. It's something that um, many churches do. There's a lot of churches, uh, and I think I, think I want to kind of capture this practice, but there's a lot of churches that they don't just celebrate Easter Sunday one Sunday of the year, but they actually take in the seven Sundays between Easter and Pentecost, they lean into what they call the Easter season. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to emphasize Jesus' resurrection between now and Pentecost. And honestly, if we understood the gospel, this place would be more packed on Pentecost Sunday than it is on Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday is amazing. Jesus rose from the dead. But on Pentecost Sunday, Jesus now lives inside of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we understood that, like... This room would be full uh, that day. So I just want us to lean into uh, the resurrection and, and just kind of this idea of how do we live out the resurrection in real life? Because I understand it's easy to walk into an Easter Sunday service and be amped up and holler a little louder and, and praise a little better, you know, do the whole thing. But Easter Sunday's come and gone and you've encountered some things between now and then, are you still living like Jesus is risen from the dead? Did you wake up the Monday after Easter going, he's alive? Did you wake up this morning going, he's alive? He lives inside of me. This is crazy, you guys. There's no other religion on this planet that says God will dwell inside of you except for ours. There's no other religion that says God's come to serve man. Do you know that? Every, every other religion in the world is, here's what you have to do to please God. And if you're good enough, then you'll, you'll get his attention. You'll get his heart. But our gospel says the king left the throne of heaven. He came, he lived, he died, he rose again, and he came as a servant to seek and to save that which is lost. I'm getting fired up. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, man, I'm excited that Jesus is risen because it means that he's living in me now. And it means that there's nothing that I face in this world that I face alone. And like what Holly was celebrating, even in the valley, I'm not alone. Even when you've blown it, you're not alone. <laughs> he's risen, you guys. And so I just, I just want to lean into this between now and Pentecost Sunday. I want to talk to you this morning from 1 John chapter 3, and we're going to see this idea of practicing righteousness, living in righteousness, because that is, what, that is what the resurrection is made available for us, is that we can actually live righteous lives. Everybody went from being pumped up to ah, righteous <laughs> And we're going to talk about that. Yeah. Yes, righteousness. Why would we not talk about this? Because this is what Jesus has paid for us to be. Now, there's, there's two, two what I think just kind of basic Greek dictionaries that a lot of people use in studying uh, the old Greek language. One is the Strong's. You've heard of the Strong's Concordance? Yes? Okay, and then there's another one called the Thayer's uh, Greek Dictionary. And the Thayer's Greek Dictionary describes righteousness, defines righteousness as this. Will you put that definition up? Uh, it, it defines righteousness. Righteousness defined is the state of him or her who is such as he or she ought to be. The resurrection of Jesus Christ means that you have been restored to the state for which he created you to live in. Now, yeah, the Bible, we, it's the Bible, it's good. <laughs> um, so the state of what we've been, we were originally designed to be, that's what the resurrection's made possible for us. Now, most of us, and myself included, when I hear that word righteousness, I think of here's the list of do's and don'ts that you have to fulfill to be righteous. 
Anybody else with me? That's why we kind of all look down when I said I'm going to talk about resurrection righteousness because you're like, oh, great. He's going to beat us up and he's going to tell us how bad we're doing at being righteous. And the truth is righteousness means this. 2 Corinthians 5 says, says something along these lines. I probably won't quote it verbatim, and I should have this verse. But he made him, God the Father, made him who knew no sin, Jesus, to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. So something happened through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ where he's not looking for us to measure up to certain standards to be righteous anymore. He has made us righteous, and now the righteousness should flow from the state of our being, you guys. That we have been made righteous. That we have been returned back to how he designed us to be in the first place. And, and what was Adam designed for? Well, he was designed to reign and to rule as God's ambassador and representative on planet Earth. So one thing was he had authority and he had a dominion. That's awesome. I'm not going to get into that a whole lot today, but that's part of what's been restored to us. Uh, but another thing was that Adam lived in union and communion and deep fellowship with God because we read in Genesis 3 where each day the Lord would come down, it says, in the cool of the evening and, and be with Adam each and every day. This, this is what he's designed us for. Communion. Righteousness is about I live in communion. I've been restored back to who he made me to be. And so now I live in communion with him. And everything that I do flows from my connection to him. Is, this, is that helping anybody? I hope it's helping you today. And I'm not even touching where I feel like I want to be yet. But I'm going to ramble a little longer because I can So if you, if you have this idea of, I'm not righteous unless I do righteous things, you're, you're missing it. You've got half of the equation, and that half is going to lead you into a works mentality where you're constantly thinking, I haven't been good enough. I haven't read my Bible enough. I missed some Sundays. Don't, don't, like, don't miss church, but, you know, a lot of people may. They think they're going to hell if they miss a Sunday from church. You know, like, okay, uh, I, I haven't read my Bible reading. We, we, we get into this notion of I've got to do all these things so I can be acceptable before the Lord. And, and that's not what he's after. He's after us understanding you do all the things because I've made you righteous. I have made you as you ought to be. And, and this is where our good works flow from. Now, don't mishear me and think that there's no righteous deeds that we do as believers because that's wrong. And John's going to show us that if you understand your righteousness, there will be righteous deeds that follow your life. But they're the fruit of your faith. Amen. They're the fruit of your correct believing in who Jesus is and what he's done for you and correct believing in you know who you are now. I don't want to live the rest of my life striving to get something that God's already given me. And that's what a lot of Christians are doing. They're striving to get what Jesus has already given. They're striving to be righteous, striving to be holy, striving to make themselves more lovable. And the truth is, you are loved because he's already loved you. You are lovable. You are righteous. You are holy. And from that, there's going to be fruit that will come. Okay, so this is, this, is the, this is the definition I want us to get. It's the state of him who is, him or her, who is as they ought to be. It's someone who is fulfilling their telos. I know there's probably not a ton of philosophy majors in the house, but uh, your, your telos is the purpose that you were designed for. Like when you're fulfilling your telos, that's what, that's what a righteous person is, someone who's fulfilling, fulfilling their purpose. Now, we live in Shawnee, America, so we have, you've probably seen this at one point or another. Let me give you an example of, 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 see, there are things that we could do that looks like we're fulfilling our purpose, but they're really not. And just because there's things that we could do doesn't mean that we should 
because it's not actually fulfilling the design for which God made us for. And, and, I, and that's what I want us to get in what our righteousness is, is we're leaning into the design that God made us for, which is communion, fellowship, love, and, and yes, good works, but it flows out of abiding in Jesus, like John 15 says. Okay, so we live in Shawnee, America, so we've seen this at some point. You've seen the guy missing about five teeth, and I'm not knocking you if you're missing about five front teeth, but you've seen the guy with about five front teeth, and he's driving his lawnmower down the sidewalk, and he's not driving it to mow the yard. He's driving it because he doesn't feel like walking. There, there was a meme on Facebook of a dude just driving down MacArthur, like just down the sidewalk. Yeah, you can use your lawnmower to get places, but that's not what it was designed for. And there's a lot of people, you're doing things that, yeah, you, you can do it, but it's not your design. It's not your purpose. It's not what, what, what God puts you here for. Like God didn't put you on planet earth just to make as much money as you possibly could. Make as much money as you can, but do it for his glory. Do it from a place of fellowship with him. He, he didn't put you on this earth just to get married and have two and a half kids or one and a half, whatever it is now. Like he didn't, he didn't just make you for that. But do get married and have a family because it's beautiful. So there, there are these things that we can elevate beyond the, the true purpose that God made us for. And then we're not living out our talos and then we're not living in righteousness. And I want us to understand that this righteousness is possible because Jesus rose. And I believe, I believe that our righteousness is how we embody the reality that Jesus rose from the dead. When the world sees a church that understands they are righteous and are living from that place of their righteousness, it will become a witness to the reality that Jesus rose from the dead because we're living out the purpose that he made us for. And it will be undeniable to a world looking on. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I, if you don't agree, that's what I hope to convince you of. I want us, listen, um, being in the charismatic Pentecostal stream, we believe in signs and wonders and miracles, and we believe that the Lord still still operates just the same way as he did in the book of Acts. We believe all that's on the table. And we've seen it. There's many people in here who can say, God has touched me. I've seen him move in unexplainable ways. Like I, 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 have, I have testimonies of, of signs and wonders that they're incredible. One of my very good friends that I still call uh, every once in a while, like his hip was deteriorating, like kind of Forrest Gump style, had the brace, like, and people said, well, by the time you're 13, 14, 15 years old, you're going to be in a wheelchair. Well, the church I was a part of, man, they prayed, they fasted, they believed. And that hip that was deteriorating grew back, and the leg had actually become shorter. It grew past the other leg. You know Ryan Wilson, don't you? Yeah. And, and, and like, God did that. It was amazing. And that's a sign and a wonder to the world. And that's good. And we want more of that. But I, I also believe a great sign and wonder to the world is a, a group of people that live from their righteousness, that are fulfilling their design and their purpose. I think it's part of what in Romans 8 says, the creation is groaning for the revealing of the sons of God. Do you understand that's what you were created to be. You were created to be a son or a daughter of God. There's a reason why you're called a human being and not a human doing. He didn't create you just to do stuff. He created you to be his son, his daughter, his friend. Living from that is righteousness. Now, let's look at 1 John chapter 3. That feels like a sufficient setup for our text. Now, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation, but if you have a different translation, it might say, behold. And I really love that word, behold, in this sense. It just feels, behold. <laughs> behold. See how very much our Father loves us. For he calls us his children, 
And that is what we are. How has God manifested his love to us? He looks us in the eye and he says, daughter. That's love. Son. This is how he's demonstrated. This is, John says, here's how God, behold, how God has shown his love for us. We're called his children. And I want, uh, as you're reading this word, see or behold, it's gonna come up three different times. So I want you to pay attention to that. See how the Father's loved us. This is our telos. This is what we've been made for, to be his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we're God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, dear friends, beloved ones, we, all, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him. Here's the word see again. For we will see him as he really is. We will behold him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure or righteous just as he is pure. Notice that it says they will keep themselves that way. What does that mean? You already are. By your faith, you are pure, you are righteous, you are holy. So part of this good work is living out who you already are. Isn't this good news? Aren't you glad I'm not not up here saying you better grit your teeth a little bit harder and, and try a little bit better? I'm just saying if you put your trust in Jesus, then live from what he's given you. Because this, this is what our salvation is. It's this gift of righteousness that we can't earn or manufacture on our own. Everyone who sins is breaking God's law. For all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away our sins. And there's no sin in him. Now listen to what this says. Anyone who continues or abides in him will not sin. But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. I like uh, New King James or NIV a little bit better on this translation. It says you have not seen him or known him. That idea of seeing. See, part of the big problem, if if we are struggling with sin, it's probably not a behavior problem. It's probably a sight problem. We're not looking at who we should be looking at. When Peter got off the boat in the middle of the storm to walk on the water with Jesus, what was his problem? When did he fail? When he stopped looking at Jesus. Do you understand that this, that could probably become a, a, a template for our discipleship now? That the greatest problem, the the greatest battle that we're going to face is whether or not we keep our eyes on Jesus in any and every situation that we face in this life. That when the person at work is going nuts, we go, you know what? I'm not going to look at them. I'm going to look at Jesus. When the world around us is going crazy, we're going to, no, I'm not going to look at the world. I'm going to look at him. When our kids are waking us up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and by us, I mean Holly. (laughs) She's going to look at Jesus and not at her husband sleeping. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Look at Jesus, baby. I'm preaching to you. See, it's easy. Our, Our problem is we're not, our eyes aren't where they should be. If you're sinning, it's because you're not seeing him. And if you're not seeing him, it's because you're not abiding close enough to him. Dear children, verse 7, this is where where we'll end. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what's right, it shows they're righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Did, Did you notice how it phrased this? When they do what's right, it shows that they're righteous. Doing what's right simply proves who you already are. Doing right 
doesn't make you right. If that's the truth, we're no different from Islam. If that's the truth, we're no different than the first 39 books of our Bible. Which I I think was a distortion of the belief, but we don't have time to go down that rabbit trail, okay? Our righteousness flows from who we already are in Jesus, okay? This is who we are. And so I want to get into how is it that because of the power of Jesus' resurrection, we can begin to become a sign and a wonder to the world. How can we do this? How can resurrection in real life looks like this? We know we're righteous and we're living righteously for the glory of our resurrected king. So how how can we do this? Can we put up that slide uh, that has the three, three ideas on it? Resurrection righteousness. Here's how it can grow. Number one, we behold Jesus. Number two, we're happy to be unknown. Number three, we live with eager expectation. This is from, from this text. I think it's, it's showing us here's how we can grow our resurrection righteousness. And we've, are, we've already hit on this pretty good. We behold Jesus. I believe that, that these verses that we've just read lays out an important paradigm for us. We behold, we become, let me say it right, we become what we behold. We become what we behold. Whatever we zone in on, that's the direction our life is going to go. Anybody ever been driving down the road? One of the things they teach you in, uh, in driver's ed is what? You look straight down the road. You have peripheral vision, but you look straight down the road between the two lines. Don't be gawking to the right or the left because what will happen if, if, you, if you, and Holly gets mad at me about this, but sometimes I'll be driving around and I, I start looking over here a little bit. And what happens when you start looking this way? The car just magically, it kind of starts veering the way that you look, doesn't it? Well, it's not magic. It's the the truth. Whatever you're looking at, that's the direction you're going to go. If you're looking at Jesus, you're going to move in the direction of Jesus. You're going (laughs) to, you're going to become who you behold. So if you're looking to Jesus, What's he going to be? Well, Hebrews tells us he'll be the author and the finisher of our faith. How much effort does that take on your part? How much work does that take on your part? He's authoring it and he's finishing it. What does he need you to do? Look to him. Look at him. Behold him. Look at what he's done. Look at the fact that he went to the cross and he died as you and for you. And Romans 6 says, you were joined with him when he died. So what does that mean? We can die to sinful inclinations and sinful desires. And am I saying that there won't be some battle that takes place in that? No, I think the scripture tells us there's going to be some battle. But if we would face the battle like this, I'm dead to that. I believe I'm dead to this. I believe I'm, I'm dead to that old sinful way of thinking. I'm dead to the, these, these sinful ways of speaking. I'm, I'm dead to these lusts that have had control of me. I'm dead to this. And yes, sometimes I'll, 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 I'll forget who I am. But if I'll, I'll look back to Jesus, I'll get myself right back where I need to be again. So whatever, whatever we look at, that's what we become. Holly told you, Graham, Graham and Ruby, they, they, they love singing. They love songs. They love some praise. Um, and I Thank God by Maverick City is kind of on repeat right now. It was praise from Elevation for a while. But right now, it's I Thank God from Maverick City. And uh, we noticed when we first started playing this song, both, both Graham and Ruby, um, if they're in the other, uh, other room doing something, as soon as the song comes on, they come running to the TV. Like, and they get there, and Graham, like, starts this little bounce. And he can actually get off the ground now. But, like, he just, he starts bouncing. And then we noticed, like, we noticed he starts, like, grabbing at his ears. Like, what are, what's he doing? Like, is his ears hurt? At first we thought, does he have an ear infection? Like, is his ears hurting? And then we recognized he was mimicking 
the guy that was leading because he has some, some uh, monitors in his ears, some headphones. And so he was actually, what he was watching, he just started doing that. My friends, that's what discipleship is. You just look at what Jesus is doing and you start doing that. And guess what? You'll live a righteous life pretty naturally. And so what, what we behold, that's what we'll become. I want to read this and then hit, uh, hit these other two briefly. Um, but this comes from a little book called Abba's Child. And I'm just going to read this because it, it, it also holds this idea. And this is really the most important idea I want you to get this morning. So we'll hammer point number one and just kind of touch on the next two and, and have some prayer. But listen to this. Contemplation is gazing at the unveiled glory of God in the risen, glorified Christ. This is what contemplation is. It's gazing at the unveiled glory of God in the risen, glorified Christ. Contemplative prayer is, above all else, looking at the person of Jesus. If we want to be people who abide in Jesus, we're going to have to learn how to contemplate him. Okay? We're going to have to learn how to look at him. We're going to have to learn how to still our hearts and our minds and, and just sit with him. And can, I, can I give you just like maybe something practical that we can do to learn how to sit and meditate on Jesus? Start with a one-minute timer. Just one minute. And just think about him for a minute. And then next week, add two. Do two minutes. And then, and then just see where it goes from there. Add a minute, maybe until you get to five or 10 minutes and, and take some of your prayer time and instead of making it just the laundry list of all the things you need, and there's nothing wrong with that, by the way, because that's what prayer is. It's bringing all our needs to the Lord. That's a good thing. But I don't, I don't want to be the person that just shows up to Jesus going, here's what I want, here's what I need, here's what I want, here's what I need, here's what I want, here's what I need, and I need this, this, and this, and could you do it by this, this, and this time? You guys are looking at me like you've never done it. I don't believe you. But learn how to contemplate on Jesus and just think about him. The prayer of simple awareness means we don't have to get anywhere because we're already there. <laughs> we're simply coming into consciousness that we possess what we seek. Contemplation defined as looking at Jesus while loving him leads not only to intimacy but to the transformation of the person contemplating. In Nathaniel Hawthorne's famous uh, short story, The Great Stone Face, a young boy stares at the face carved in granite and regularly asks tourists in town if they know the identity of the face on the mountain. No one does. Into manhood and midlife and old age, he continues to gaze on the face at every opportunity until one day a tourist passing through exclaims to the once young boy who is now a weather-beaten old man, you are the face on the mountain. Contemplative awareness of the risen Jesus shapes our resemblance to him and turns us into the persons God intended us to be. Friends, the way that we embody righteousness and become a sign and a wonder to the world around us is we learn how to behold Jesus. We, we don't make that a thing in our walk with Jesus, we make it the thing. We make it priority one. I'm going to look at him. And I'm going to think about him. Because as I do, I'm going to be changed and transformed more and more into his image. And I think as that happens, the second thing that we see, we'll be happy to be unknown. Because you know what? When you think about this, I know in the, in the Gospels, we see, we see Jesus' public life, and we just assume that, that, man, the most important thing to Jesus was this public life and this public ministry that he had. But if he only lived 33 years, then that means only 10% was spent in public. 30 years of his life, 90% of his life was spent in obscurity. It was spent just working with his hands as a carpenter with Joseph. It, it was spent not being known. What happens? There's so many people that are obsessed with, do I have influence? Do I get enough likes on social media? Are people seeing me? Am I known? 
And what happens is as we behold Jesus, the only thing we care about is that we're known about him, by him. And then it causes us to lead our lives with an eager expectation. With an eager expectation. Do you recognize, like, Jesus is coming, you guys. And I'm not going to get out here and show you the prophecy timeline, and I'm not against those things, but here's what I know. Every generation has lived with some urgency and believed in some way he's coming in my lifetime, and I think that's the way it should be. We should have that kind of urgency that I'm going to live to see that eastern sky part, and the risen man, Jesus Christ, is going to be there in the clouds coming in glory, and I'm going to be ready when he comes. So there's this eager expectation. And here's the thing. While we behold him in this state, we're becoming becoming what we will fully be when he finally comes in all his glory. See, I, I don't believe that that means we just go, oh yeah, someday I'll be righteous when Jesus finally gets here. No, it's saying I become righteous now as I wait for him to come. Because the scripture does say he's coming for a bride that is radiant and holy without spot or blemish. So another reason why I want to look like Jesus and look at Jesus is so that I will be ready and live with this eager expectation that he's going to show up and I'll be prepared for it. Because I've been looking at him and I've been becoming like him. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says it like this if the musicians would go ahead and make their way back up. 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of the reverence of God. Yeah, I had a different translation than that, but it says pretty much the same thing. Because we have this expectation, because we recognize, we we. Jesus has risen from the dead, and so it means here's what's possible. I can live a life of resurrection now. We looked at Romans 8.11 last week, where it says, if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you. And the idea of that little phrase is this, the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. The spirit that Jesus lived in perfect submission to. The the spirit that Jesus followed throughout his life and depended upon. The spirit that led him to go to the cross. The spirit that caused him to be raised from the dead. The, The spirit that was with him when he ascended to the right hand. And the spirit that came down on the day of Pentecost to live inside of us. That spirit is alive in us right now. Making it possible for us to live righteously, to live into what he designed us to be. As image bearers of his glory, yeah? And that is people who are deeply intimate with him, friends of God, sons and daughters of God. That's what he's made for us. And that's what I wanna live into. That's what, that's what I hope all of us would say, man, If this is what the resurrection is meant for me to have, then that's what I want. I'll close with this question. Is our righteousness a sign and a wonder to the reality of Jesus' resurrection? Pretty much asking the same question I asked last week in a little bit different way. But I think it's, I think that one question, we may contemplate that question every Sunday between now and Pentecost. Because it's just a good question to ask. Like when people see me, would they go, something? They may not be able to put language on it, but they would look at our lives and they'd go, ah, I can't explain. I can't explain that love. I can't explain that joy. I can't explain how they can look at every situation and see the possibility of life. If we're resurrection people, that's how we should view everything, right? Through the lens of nothing's impossible for our God. 
He died and rose from the dead. So is our righteousness a sign and wonder to the reality of the resurrection? That's what I want my life to be. I hope when people think about me, talk about me, I hope when my kids uh, are grown, maybe after I'm gone, I hope that they will go, you know, I, I, I don't hope they say, yeah, my dad was a great preacher. I hope they say, my dad made me believe that Jesus really rose from the dead because I could see a risen Jesus in him. That's what, I mean, I kind of hope that's what people say at my funeral. Like, he actually believed it. He lived it. Like, he believed that Jesus rose from the dead. And you could tell he believed it in his life, the way that he lived, the way that he treated people. Because if, if, if it doesn't change that, then what are we doing? If it doesn't change how we love people, if it doesn't change how we serve people, if it doesn't change how we do family, if it doesn't change how we spend our money, if it, if it doesn't actually change anything in real life, then, then what is all this resurrection stuff? Other than us just saying we, we believe something. But belief in the Bible changes our actions. And that's what I hope our, that's what I hope resurrection righteousness will be in our lives. That it will be something that spurs us to live a life that causes people to go. Something had to happen. Because I can see their life. Would you stand with me? sit with that for maybe like 30 seconds or a minute and just ask the Holy Spirit Lord would you show us where we're where we are living a life that's a sign and wonder and would you show us those areas where we're falling short too because we know when you show us that it's not to condemn but it's to correct so that we can altar's open if you want to come.